Welcome to the RPG Players Guild. My name is Gordon Jackson, and we're going to be talking about races today. The app I'm going to be using here um, throughout this series of videos is the 5e character app put out by Dungeon Developer, available at the uh, Google Play Store. This app is really good. It has every class, every race, every background, and all the feats that are available in Dungeons & Dragons 5e. You can manage sources when you first get it and download every source book that's in the game so that you have access to all of it in one spot. If your dungeon master just wants to play through the player's handbook, you can select player's handbook only and you're only going to be looking at races for the player's handbook. Same thing with classes, you're only going to be looking at classes that are available in the standard edition. If your DM wants to uh, play Eberron's Rising from the Last War and that's the campaign you're going to be playing and that's where all of your adventures are going to be at, you can come in and all you're going to find is the stuff that's available through that source book. Um, very good app. So let's get started. All right, let's talk about dwarves. So when you think about fantasy races that are out there and you go up to the average person who's never played D&D, doesn't do any of the RPG games, and you ask them to tell you races that are out there, dwarf is going to come up. It's going to be the first or second one that comes up. They're very iconic. I think most people, when you think of dwarves, are thinking of, uh, especially with the Lord of the Rings, thinking Gimli, and it draws that image. So let's go look at like what we've got going on here. I always like to come and, and try and find some picture. A picture is worth a thousand words, and try and find some picture that kind of represents the character that I want to play. Now in D&D, <clears throat> clerics... Fighters, Barbarians, Paladins, those are the top four classes that people play, Dwarfs. And looking at the images that are online, I, I've always said, and I'll, and I'll continue to say, that when Dwarves are born, the family members are having pools. And it's not a pool to see whether or not it's going to be a boy Dwarf or a girl Dwarf. It's a pool to see whether or not they pop out with an axe, a war hammer, or a sword in their hand, um, because that's the way they're going to be typically depicted. And axes are obviously, number one, there really should only be a, a several clans, the Axe Clan, the Warhammer Clan. But looking at uh, images of them, there's you can get quite a good uh, idea of, of how dwarves are depicted in fantasy. The one thing about dwarves is, is that their culture... It's like not as full, even though they've been around forever. When you look, it's always in the mountain. They're, they don't have that full, rich culture. And I'd really like to see characters with backstories that are other than just, uh, I was a dwarf and I was in mining or I was in stone cutting. Think about in dwarf society, there's going to be goldsmiths and weaponsmiths and people that never mind. And there's going to be, where do they get their food? <clears throat> I really think the whole idea of a, a dwarf druid and some other classes work really well. You get those, those clerics with their, uh, their holy symbol. One of the ones that I've, the little dwarf monk, not a big fan of the monk class in particular, but uh, you know, trying to find some image that represents what you're looking for. The paladin, that holy warrior. Now there are some Dwegar. These are gray, uh, gray dwarves. You can get some pretty good images of what gray dwarves look like. They've got a little bit storied background. This one right here was. This right here is <clears throat> not represented when you look at the the history of some of these dwarven civilizations. But you would think that as a full civilization being self-sufficient, being able to take care of itself, and then once it encounters another race, doing trade with that other race, um, this right here gives you a pretty good idea of what a, a just a normal dwarf villager, not everybody's swinging a pickaxe, and not everybody's the warrior, and some different looks on it. I would like to see a dwarven society because when you think of dwarven societies, you think of the big mountain and everybody's living in the mountain and the dwarves are in it. I'd like to see this type, this right here represented where when you're coming up to that dwarven civilization, they have terraced the entire outside of that mountain. 
they are obviously building great halls in this mountain and they are dwelling deep down into it but on the outside they've built these big terraces and they've built this so that they can sustain the, their society and the dwarves that are living on the outside that are doing the farming and doing the uh, harvesting of of crops and fruits and nuts the herders you can't forage when you've got if you've got 10 20 30,000 people in this dwarven mine um, foraging is not going to sustain you for very long. I really like to see dwarf cultures that have this type of dynamic where when you come up to it, you really get a feel for how much they have carved the earth on the inside and on the outside. <clears throat> so let's look at dwarven stats. So the first thing is if we were using Tasha's Cauldron of, Every of Everything, you can put these ability scores where you'd like them so that we can try and get... And one of the cool things about those alternate rules or optional rules is, is that we can try and get our characters away from just being clerics, fighters, barbarians, and paladins where we, now we can, we can explore trying to be one of these other classes, a rogue or a druid, where we can put this plus two constitution. We can put that somewhere else that more suits our character's backstory. So your standard dwarf is going to get these features, and then for your sub-races, we've got four different sub-races, and then we're going to get additional ability score increases for those sub-races. So here we have a plus two ability score increase. Um, our size is medium, and our speed is 25. A little bit slower than humans and elves. Age, dwarves mature at the same rate as humans, but they're considered young until they reach the age of 50. On average, they live about 350 years. Um, alignment. Um, if you're playing a character, any alignment's going to work good. When you're encountering dwarves out there, just as a society, um, the generally most dwarves are going to be lawful, believing firmly in the beliefs of a well-ordered society. They tend towards good as well, with a strong sense of fair play and a belief that everyone deserves to share in the benefits of a just order. Size, dwarves stand between 4 and 5 feet tall and average about 150 pounds. Your size is medium. Your speed is not reduced by wearing heavy armor. This is why you're going to see a lot of, of martial um, dwarves or, you know, this heavy armor right here is a big deal. Dark vision. Accustomed to life underground, you have superior vision in dark and dim conditions. You can see in light within 60 feet of you as if it were bright light and darkness as if it were dim light. You can't discern color in darkness, only shades of gray. Dwarven Resilience. You have advantage on savings throws against poison. You have resistance against poison damage. Dwarven Combat Training. You have proficiency with the Battle Axe, Hand Axe, Light Hammer, and War Hammer. Another cool thing about the Tasha's Cauldron of Everything's optional rules is that when you have these types of proficiencies, just like with the ability scores, you can go, hey, I am going to use a Battle Axe, or I am going to use a Hand Axe, but I'm never going to use a Light Hammer, and I'm never going to use a War Hammer. And you can swap those out, so a martial weapon for another martial weapon or another tool or simple weapon. So you can change those out to customize that to your character so that you're not carrying four here and three of them you're never going to use. Which, once again, gives you a lot of diversity with your characters. Tool proficiencies. You gain proficiency with the artisan tools of your choice. Smith's tools, brewer's supplies, and mason's tools. The one on here that really interests me is the brewer supplies because if we created like if you're a dm and you're creating you're doing the world building and you've got that dwarven civilization and you've got that full rich dwarven civilization where they're self-sufficient they trade think about how much leather it takes to make armor or cloth to make clothing and so there's things that they would trade for that they don't make and they're trading stuff that they make for it but when your society is is really dependent on another society to get all of its food that's really bad that's that trade imbalance thing where that that causes big problems so if we have a full rich dwarven society um, brewer supplies which you, you look at their back stuff here their backstory and you're like brewer supplies i i think of the character that that did come up and he knows the or he or she knows the secrets of making that that honey ale or that honey mead, that dwarven honey mead, and can can use that on, especially in your downtime when you're in a city, if you're doing the role playing stuff, it gives you that ability to, to really kind of work your character and make a name for themselves. 
I can see a lot of fun fun with that. You can, if once again, if you're using Tasha's, you can trade out proficiencies with through your backstory. You, if you can work with your DM, you could trade some of those out because I can also see your family being the ones that were goldsmiths or silversmiths, and they made that jewelry and they made that stuff. So you have proficiencies in with jewelers' tools or you know working that story so that we have a much richer society as opposed to just being the cleric, fighter, barbarian, and paladin. Stone cutting. Whenever you make an intelligence history check related to the origin of stonework, you are considered proficient in the history skill and add double your proficiency bonus to this check instead of your normal proficiency bonus. This is another one of those ones that working with your DM, let's say you pick the brewer supplies. Maybe instead of stone cutting, you got some other one. This is where you could really... Um, tailor that character and customize it through your backstory to really build a rich history for your character. Languages. You can speak, read, and write common and dwarvish. Dwarvish is full of hard consonants and guttural sounds, and those characteristics <coughs> sp excuse me, spill over into whatever other language a dwarf might speak. That's why in in modern fantasy or in television and movies, it's always either like a Scottish or it's a Russian and even if they're speaking Elvish, that, that's gonna, they're going to sound Russian speaking Elvish. So we have four subclasses here. So Dwager, these are the gray dwarves. And the gray dwarves and regular dwarves have a storied history. The gray dwarves went so deep that they finally ran into some mind flayers and got enslaved for um, eons. And when they came out of it, now they've kind of like done the thing where now they're the slavers and they don't, they don't necessarily get along with, uh, with regular dwarves. So if, you're, <clears throat> if your DM's allowing you to play Dwegar, you will get an additional plus one to your strength. So you're going to get a plus two to con and, or, and a plus one to strength, or you can put those wherever you'd like if your DM's letting you use op the optional rules from Tasha's. You're going to have superior dark vision, accustomed to life underground. You have superior vision in darkness and dim conditions. You can see in dim light within 20, 120 feet as if you were in bright light and in darkness as if you were in dim light. Once again, you're not going to be able to discern colors in darkness, only shades of gray. Um, Dwegar Resilience. You have advantage on saving throws against poison, and you have resistance against poison damage. That's the same as your normal dwarf. You also have advantage on saving throws against illusions and against being charmed or paralyzed. So you're going to get some extra stuff there. Languages. You can speak, read, and write common, dwarvish, and undercommon. So once again, you're going to, get a, you're going to pick up another language. So you're going to pick up a couple things here, and you're going to pick up an additional language. Dwegger Magic. When you reach third level, you can cast in large reduce spell on yourself once with this trait, using only the spells in large option. When you reach <clears throat> fifth level, you can cast the invisibility spell on yourself once with this trait. You don't need material components for either spell, and you can't cast them while you're in direct sunlight. Although sunlight has no effect on them once cast, you regain the ability to cast these spells with this trait when you finish a long rest. Intelligence is your spell casting ability for these spells. So that's really big right there to be able to cast spells, number one, without any material components and at will. So if you had a magic user, <clears throat> wizard, warlock, sorcerer, druid, and you're doing these, you're not going to you're not going to have to use one of those precious spell slots to be able to cast um, in large and invisibility once per day. So that, that anytime you can use magic and not have to use a spell slot is huge. Sunlight sensitivity. You have disadvantage on attack rolls and wisdom perception checks that rely on sight when you, the target of your attack, or whatever you are trying to perceive is in direct sunlight. So that is a little bit of a disadvantage right there. And I can tell you, if you were playing a Dwager, I and I was the DM, I would definitely enforce that rule because that is you're getting some pretty good benefits being in that race, but there are some drawbacks. If you're a hill a hill dwarf, um, they're going to get a plus one. So with your ability score, the standard is plus one in wisdom, but you have a plus one if you're using the optional rules. Dwarven toughness, your hit points maximum 
increases by one, and it increases by one every time you gain a level. So if you're a hill dwarf and a mountain dwarf, the hill dwarf, if they rolled exactly the same and they were six level, the hill dwarf is going to have six more hit points. Every level you're going to get plus one to your hit point. Now the way that it works is, is that you're going to get all of these abilities, and then you're going to pick up that dwarven toughness. I'm going to come back to Mark of Warding. Uh, mountain Dwarves. This is going to be a very popular race right here, sub-race, especially with Tasha's, because it gives you a plus two in strength. So your standard would be a plus two in strength and a plus two in con. And if you're using the optional rules where you can put those wherever you'd like, this is going to be a very popular race to play because you're getting two plus twos when most races are going to give you a plus two and a plus one. So I can see Mountain Dwarves becoming very, very popular. Um, if you're a Mountain Dwarf, you got the plus two. You get Dwarven Armor training. You have proficiency with light and medium armor. Now let's go back to the Mark of Warding. There's, if you're playing a house that has, if you're playing a game where your DM is allowing you to play Dragon Marks, there's the house houses that have Dragon Marks. And so each mark is kind of representing represented by a race. And the mark of warding is represented by dwarves. And if you're playing this, you're going to get an ability score of plus one, where you can put where you'd like. Um, the warder's intuition. When you make an intelligence investigation check or an ability check using thieves tools, you can roll a die four and add the number rolled to the ability check. So it's going to give you a little bit. So really, if you're playing, you know, thinking about like rogue or this could open up some of that stuff. Wards and seals. <clears throat> you can cast the alarm and mage armor spells with this trait. Starting at third level, you can also cast the arcane lock spell with it. Once you cast any of these spells with this trait, you can't cast the spell again until you finish a long rest. Intelligence is your spell casting ability for these spells. You don't need material components for them when you cast them with this trait. So once again, anytime you can cast spells, and if you look at the thieves tools and you're looking here, this is really kind of putting you down that path where um, that rogue looks pretty good. There's a lot of classes that you could really explore depending on how you want to build your character, but if your DM's allowing the mark of the wording and allowing those dragon marked ca characters, this is pretty cool. Spells of the mark. If you have the spell casting or packed magic class feature, the spells on the mark of wording spells table are added to the spell list for your sub excuse me, spell casting class. So even if your your class doesn't normally have the ability to get alarm, if you're playing a mark of the wording dwarf, you would be able to get alarm and armor. Agathys at first level, Arcane Lock, Knock, Glyph of Warding, Magic Circle, Lehman's Secret Chest, Mordecai's Faithful Hound, and Anti-Life Shell. I, I always like playing any race that gives me... I, I like playing casters. I like playing... Um, I like playing characters that have access to lots of magic and not playing so much the martial characters. And anytime you can pick up some additional stuff, especially stuff that you don't have to use your precious spell slots for, um, that's pretty big. So we have a lot of options with, with dwarves. I really like to see with Tasha's Cauldron of Everything coming out and the optional rules where we can put our stats where we want them so that we can really build our character along the class that we want so that we can adjust their backstory. I'd really like to see Dwarven Society expanded a little bit in doing research, there's not a lot on, you know, dwarves have been around for the beginning of the game, but they're very, it, there's not a lot of dimension to how people have built up dwarven societies. And so you could really work your backstory, especially, I really like the thing about the, the brewer's tools or what you did and what your family did within that society. All right. That was a little bit on dwarves. Um, very, very old, very, we've got lots of choices here, so um, it, maybe your next character will be a dwarf. All right, thanks for watching. If you like the channel, hit subscribe. If you like the video, hit like. If I, I love comments on, on these because I'm looking at a, a lot of these races and I, I like to role play, so when you talk about percentage-wise, I, I don't mind the 75-25 or... 
75% of the time we're role playing and we're trying to explore that stuff and we're really trying to expand. And so I tend to think, you know, and backstory is very important to me and trying to build those rich histories so that you can really give your, your, your dungeon master the opportunity to give hooks to really propel the story forward instead of just being where every time we have to play it's got to be some combat situation where we really have things that we can we can play on based off of our backstory and dwarves should have a very rich history and maybe we can help create that thanks for watching